In this video, we're going to talk about the small signal modeling of PMOS and PNP transistors. So let's begin with the PMOS transistor shown here. And I'm going to start with a simple but what can be a surprising assertion for people just learning electronics, which is that the small signal model for the PMOS transistor is exactly the same as the small signal model for the NMOS transistor. Many new learners for electronics have a strong intuition that the polarity of this current source should perhaps be flipped or some other polarity should be flipped, but the truth is that's not the case. So to see how, I'm going to try and make a qualitative argument first, and then we'll look at the equations a little more closely to see why this is the case. The first thing that can be confusing is that PMOS transistors are typically drawn upside down compared to their NMOS counterparts. The source of the PMOS transistor is usually drawn at the top of the schematic, and this is done for a good reason, and that's because in normal operation, the source is at a higher voltage, and we tend to put higher voltages towards the top of the page in schematics. So to help us line this up with the small signal model shown on the right, let's flip it around a bit. So now that we've reoriented the small signal model to better align with the schematic on the left, let's just relabel things so that uh, they're legible. And let's think about now what happens if we increase the voltage VSG by some small amount. Now we should understand intuitively that this implies a decrease in the gate voltage. which we should understand to increase the inversion level of the PMOS transistor. That is, the channel's be gonna become more inverted or stronger. So we should expect the drain current to increase. And the expression for drain current uh, governed by the square law on the bottom here predicts just that. If we increase VSG and we see an increase in the quadratic term and an increase in the drain current. Now, if we think about that in terms of the small signal model on the right, these changes in voltage are indeed the small signals that we're trying to model. So VGS in the model on the right is really equal to negative delta VSG. And the small signal drain current flowing in here in the direction indicated by the dependent current source is flowing in the opposite direction from drain to source as delta ID. So this is then equal to negative delta ID. So because of the double negative here, everything works out nicely. On the left, VSG increases and the current flowing out of the drain increases. On the right, VGS decreases and so we've got small signal current flowing into the drain which really represents an increase in the current flowing out of the drain. Now if that's still confusing for you there's another way we can look at it. Here again is the square law equation governing the drain current of the PMOS transistor but now let's rewrite it instead of in terms of the current flowing out of the drain let's define IDN, the negative of the drain current, which simply has the opposite polarity. It's the current flowing into the drain and out the source of the PMOS transistor. Now, in normal operation, we expect the value of this current to be negative, but that shouldn't present much of a problem mathematically. All that happens is we can repeat the square law here, but we simply put a negative sign out front because we've defined IDN to have the opposite polarity as ID. Now we can make a further manipulation here. If we negate everything in the quadratic term here, that should have no effect because taking the square simply um, you know, makes that negation irrelevant. And one final change here is that instead of writing this expression in terms of VSG, we can write it in terms of VGS. And clearly, VSG equals negative VGS. So we make that substitution in here. 
and we're left with the final expression at the bottom. Now, a key point is that this square law is valid only when VSG exceeds the absolute value of the threshold voltage of the PMOS transistor. So since we've rewritten this bottom expression in terms of VGS, the condition is flipped around. So VGS has to be less than negative that threshold voltage. And the nice thing about this expression here is that we're defining everything in terms of variables IDN and VGS that have the same polarity as the small signal model on the right. So the gate source voltage is VGS and the drain current in the small signal model is defined as current flowing into the drain and out the source. So that's the same polarities that are used in this bottom expression here. If we sketch a plot of that bottom expression, then we end up with something like this. Now you remember that you only enter square law in this case when VGS is less than negative VTP and that beyond there you have this square law quadratic relationship here. So that's essentially a plot of this bottom expression here. And the idea is that the small signal model is valid when the transistor is operating in saturation, so some operating point over here. And the small signal parameter GM is nothing more than the slope of this curve evaluated at the operating point Q. So you can see here that the slope is still positive because again, it's because of the double negative uh, involved here. So there's no reversal in the polarity of GM and we've still got a positive transconductance with respect to VGS and the PMOS transistor and uh, the same small signal model is applicable. A very similar argument is applicable to the small signal modeling of channel length modulation in a PMOS transistor. So if we apply a small increment of voltage delta VSD between source and drain here, that's going to appear in the small signal model as a negative voltage between drain and source. Now, intuitively, we know that that increment in VSD is going to result in some extra current flowing out of the drain, delta ID. And that increment of current we know should be related to delta VSD by this resistance RO. And that's exactly what we see using the small signal model on the right, which is the same small signal model we use to the NMOS transistor negative voltage applied across RO is going to result in an extra increment of current flowing this way out the drain, just as we expect from our intuition on the left. And that's indeed the extra current delta ID, which is equal to delta VSD over RO. So again, the same small signal model is applicable to the PMOS transistor as we use to the MMOS transistor. All the very same arguments are applicable to the small signal modeling of the PNP BJT. That is, the same small signal model can be used for the PNP transistor as is used for the NPN transistor. And rather than go through all the same arguments again, here let's just dive into a, an example of using the small signal model to analyze a circuit with a PNP transistor in it. So we're beginning with the circuit shown here on the left, and our objective here is to find the small signal gain from the voltage input VI to VO on the right. So you'll see the input is applied to the emitter here and the output taken at the collector. As always, step one in our analysis here will be to find the DC operating point. Now, in order to do so, we can simplify the schematic, recognizing that the capacitors will be open circuit at DC. So we need not include them in our 
DC operating point analysis on the right. We're also going to use a simple constant voltage drop model for the BJT. So in this case, we've got 0.7 volt drop here, establishing an emitter voltage of 0.7 volts. From there, we can find that the voltage drop across this 10K resistor is 9.3 volts. So that gives rise to a emitter current of 0.93 milliamps. Uh, we're told that beta is 100 in this example. So alpha is about 0.99. Hence, the collector current is 0.92. And then finally, we can find the DC voltage at the collector uh, by just finding the voltage drop on this 5K resistor. 0 0.92 milliamps times 5 kilo ohms. That's 4.6 volts. So we know the collector voltage is negative 5.4 volts. And that's important because we do a final check and confirm that the voltage of the collector is uh, sufficient, provides sufficient voltage drop here to keep the transistor in active mode. Therefore, our assumption beta equals 100 is valid. Remember that if the BJT were in saturation, then we would have a forced beta that's much smaller than 100 and our calculation of the collector current would be different. So our uh, implicit assumption the transistor is in active mode turns out to be correct. And we've now found the operating point. We can proceed to our small signal analysis. Step two is to prepare the circuit for our linear analysis. Now, we're interested in small signals applied at the input and appearing at the output. Now, the way this circuit is designed, large coupling capacitors, CC1 and CC2, are being used to connect the small signal voltage input VI to the amplifier and to take the small signal voltage output VO from the amplifier. The assumption here is that the signals of interest are time varying and that the capacitors are large enough so that at all frequencies of interest to us, that is all frequency content in the input and output of this amplifier, are at a high enough frequency that we can consider those capacitors to be short circuits when we're analyzing the circuit with respect to the small signals VI and VO. So um, we sometimes will just write a shorthand notation where we say that these capacitors have infinite value. That is, we're just assuming that we're gonna have to choose them large enough so that this assumption is valid. So in our small signal analysis, we replace CC1 and CC2 with short circuits. So that's the implicit assumption there. We also have set the supply voltages to zero volts. Again, in the AC analysis, we um, set all other independent voltage sources to zero that have already been considered in the DC analysis. And uh, we're left with the simplified schematic here on the right. Then the final step in order to prepare the circuit for small signal analysis is to replace this with its small signal model. In this example, we're going to use a T model. And remember that we can use the same small signal model for this PNP transistor that we use for NPN transistors. So here's what we end up with when we place the transistor with its small signal equivalent. This type of amplifier is referred to as a common base stage because the base terminal of the transistor is connected to ground or a small signal ground at least.
the input, as I said, is applied to the emitter, the output taken at the collector. That's always the case with common base amplifiers, whether they're NPN or PNP transistors. So using the team model on the right, you end up with a totally linear circuit that's amenable to linear circuit analysis. So now we're ready for the final step, which is to perform the small signal linear analysis. which is generally just a matter of writing and solving some nodal equations. So in this case, the small signal input VI appears across the resistance RE. So therefore the current small signal emitter current IE is flowing uh, in the opposite direction. The default polarity with which we define it is flowing out the emitter, whether it's NPN or PMP. So in this case, the emitter current is negative VI over RE, as shown here. Um, the collector current is almost equal to the emitter current. It's just multiplied by a factor of alpha, which is about 0.99 in this case. And then finally, we end up with an output voltage that's just equal to negative the collector current times RC. If we substitute in alpha IE for RC, we get a double negative and we get the final expression alpha RC over RE BI. Now, um, We've got to substitute in the value for RE. Recall that RE is PT over the DC operating point emitter current, which we calculated in step one. So if we plug in the value of 0 0.93 milliamps from there, we end up with about 27 ohms. And RC, you may recall, is five kilo ohms. So plugging those two values in along with alpha of 0.99 gives us a voltage gain from VI to VO of about 182 volts per volt. So that's our voltage gain, AV.